Hello and welcome to the Just and Sinner podcast. Once again, I am your host, Dr. Jordan Cooper. And just a quick reminder that Justin Center as an organization is supported by donors. So please consider becoming a regular contributor to Just and Center, or you can give a one-time gift. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which means that any gifts that you give to us are tax deductible. You can go to justandcenter.org and go to our donate page to help us out there. Now, uh, on the program today, uh, we're going to be talking Trinity theology. Now, I, in the past, have done a number of programs on Trinitarian theology. So I did a, a couple different series. I did a series on the eternal functional subordination uh, controversy. I did a series on social Trinitarianism. I did a series of interviews uh, with some other thinkers, theologians who are thinking through doctrine of God and Trinitarian issues. And I, I made the decision uh, as I was looking through that, especially with the last program I just did on the Filioque, uh, to put these together into a kind of series like I've done with the Christology series, because I realized, you know, if I keep going through Trinitarian issues, eventually this is going to be a pretty like comprehensive series of lectures covering various elements of Trinitarian thought, both, you know, exegetically, systematic theology, uh, in terms of systematic theology, but then also in terms of church history. So uh, we've now, I've now uh, renamed all of these as the uh, Intro to Trinitarian Theology series, just like we did with the Intro to Christology series. And uh, they all have thumbnails that look kind of similar now, so they all look like they match. You can find a playlist on the, the YouTube channel. If you're listening on the podcast, I don't have an easy way to do a playlist kind of thing. So if you want to kind of see the logical order of these things, you can look at what's on the YouTube channel, I guess, and listen to the podcast in that order. So I know that's not quite as convenient, but uh, it's nothing really I can do about that per se. Um, so this is going to be the second in this series. The first in the series is uh, in, in explanation and defense of the Trinity from Scripture. So that was a very kind of basic level how do we know that the Trinity is a biblical doctrine or is the Trinity a biblical doctrine? Um, and there we basically addressed the Trinity in terms of, of three primary questions that we're asking of Scripture. Uh, one, the first question is, uh, is there one God? Right? And we came to the conclusion that yes, there is one God. We believe we're a, believe in monotheism according to Scripture. Uh, and the second is, is the Father God, is the Son God, and is the Spirit God? Are all three God? in scripture? And we've answered yes to that question. And then we had the third question, which is, are the Father, Son, and Spirit all distinct? And we've answered yes to that question. So those three basic propositions set forth the basic theological, exegetical groundwork for what we mean when we're talking about the doctrine of the Trinity. So this here then is following up on that. And I initially, I planned on doing a follow-up to that a long time ago, and I had some other programs planned, and I just hadn't done it. So now I'm actually finally getting back to what I wanted to, to do a little while ago, which was to follow up on that. So I do have a PowerPoint, as you can tell if you're watching this, uh, which should help you to, to follow along with some of these terms. So we're going to talk about some of the basic terms that we use in Trinitarian theology, and then talk about some of the other questions that we didn't talk about there, such as the eternal generation of Christ, the procession of the Spirit. How is it that the triune persons all relate to one another. Um, so that's what we're going to be exploring here. All right, so we're going to start by just talking about what some of the basic terms that we're using in Trinitarian theology are. So if you hear these terms, you know what it is that we're talking about. Now, the, the first term that we're talking about here is usia, uh, which means a substance or essence. So you'll see You'll see all of this; these terms used in Trinitarian discourse in different ways, a substance or an essence, a kind of a what, of what the thing is. Um, usia is the Greek term. Uh, homo usias is well known as being a primary point of debate in uh, at the Council of Nicaea between the Nicene uh, tradition and the tradition coming from Arius, uh, who was one of the early considered one of the early heretics or great heretics of the church, if you can call heretics great. But uh, all right, so uh, let's see, usia. So how is this understood? Now, I have a quote here, a definition from 
Johann Wilhelm Bayer, who was a 17th century Lutheran theologian. By the way, the, the quotes and basic outline of this are taken from Revere Fleck and Widener's System of Dogmatics. This is a hardbound volume that we released. This is volume one. Um, and uh, we're going to have a, a series of four hardbound volumes. Been working on the second one for quite a while, so it is coming. I know a lot of people have asked, but uh, go to jspublishing.org if you want to get a cop hard copy of this. So I've, I've used some of the quotes and basic outline from, from Widener here as I'm going through this thought, not, not exclusively. So uh, here's the definition by Bayer. He says, by the name essence is meant the divine nature as it is absolutely in itself all of which, with its attributes, is most simply one and singular, and thus also of the three persons. The essence is only one, so indeed that there is only one intellect of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, by which they understand, one will of the three by which they wish, and one power by which they operate outside of the divine essence. And so when we're using the term essence here, we're saying something beyond what we're saying when we're talking about a human essence. Because when we speak about a human essence and I say, you know, I have a human essence and so do my kids and so does my wife and, you know, so, so, so does somebody I've never met who lives on the other side of the world. There, it is true that we have this commonality and that we have a shared essence. But when we're speaking about the unity of essence between the persons of the triune Godhead, we're clearly saying something a lot more than that. We're saying that there, there is a kind of sharing and unity that is far beyond just you know, a regular genus and species or something like that, or regular categorizations. Um, so we're using the term essence, but we're not using it in the same way that we use it of humans. And we have to recognize when we're doing Trinitarian theology at all, we are using terms that are really the best that we can do, right? We have to recognize that as human creatures, we don't totally and fully understand God. We cannot. That's an impossibility. God speaks to us analogously. He uses uh, analogies and things that we can grasp and understand. So we have to recognize when we're using these terms, we are using terms to describe things in the best way we can. There's not going to be an exact equation between how these things are understood in ordinary life and how they are understood with reference to the divine. So we shouldn't expect all of that to be the case. Uh, so Bayer has some ways to explain elements of how it is that there is a shared essence that would distinguish the unity that we have of the persons of the Godhead from, say, the, the unity between two regular, ordinary human persons. So he speaks about uh, unity of three things here, and we, we can add more, but this is what Bayer includes in his definition. There is a unity of intellect, so there is one mind, right? Obviously, that's different that's a difference with God and myself. <laughs> that nobody reads into my mind. I don't have a shared mind with somebody else or not Borg or something. Um, so that's one way to express the uniqueness of this, the unity of the persons of the Godhead. There is one single intellect rather than three separate intellects. Uh, there is one single will, not three wills. And this is something that we discuss uh, in the Social Trinitarian videos that I've done and podcasts that I've done. Uh, then we have also a unity of power. So they're not separate acts and powers of the three persons from one another. So you see that there's no such thing as a unified human intellect, will, and power between multiple persons. We can kind of come together and think through things together and use our intellects together, or we can uh, choose to use both of our wills or three of our wills or however many you have in a particular group uh, to you know, pursue a common project or a common goal, and you can use your powers together to accomplish great things. Uh, but that's not done with one will or one power, or one intellect, as is true of divine unity. So we have that term, uh, usia or essence, a singular essence, one essence, one substance. Uh, and uh, again, that term is not directly a biblical term. We are simply trying to use terminology that best fits the truths that we do have in scripture. So if you want to, if you're asking, well, where does this come from in scripture? You can watch the first program where we overview all of the basics of where this comes from in scripture. And now we're using theological terminology to try to explain or express the truths that are laid out in scripture. Uh, so the second term here is hypostasis, which means person. And you, you, there are some other terms that are used among some of the church fathers it's not just person, but those tended to be misused or misunderstood. We'll talk about that as we get into some of the history in, in a later program on this. So how do we define then the uniqueness of persons or the distinction of persons? Because we've already said before this that the 
the unity that is shared between the persons has a unity of will and intellect and if in power and if that's the case that means that the distinction between persons is different than the distinction between you know one human and another human or one dog and another dog or, or something else uh, where we're defining individual things as belonging to a broader category so Martin Chemnitz has this definition, uh, Martin Chemnitz, 16th century, second generation uh, Lutheran reformer. He says, an individual, intelligent, incommunicable substance, which is not sustained either upon another or by another. So a couple of points of this definition to, to point out. One is it's an individual. So there are not, you know, a person does not identify multiple things. It's one single individual. There is an intelligence that is mentioned here. So when we're talking, we're using the term person, we're speaking about personality in some way, things that, that we categorize with personhood. So we're not speaking about something that is impersonal, in other words, uh, just kind of impersonal force, say. An incommunicable substance. And so when we say that it is an incommunicable substance, this is something that differentiates person from essence. So in terms of essence, it is communicable. The divine essence is communicable, which what we mean by that is that the divine essence is shared, right? It's shared between father, son, and spirit. And there's an ordering to that from father to son, and then from father and son to spirit. So there, there is an order to that that sharing of divine essence, but the essence is communicable to the three persons. So it's something that is shared. The hypostasis or personhood is that element that is not shared. In other words, the father does not share his fatherhood with the son. The father does not share his fatherhood with the spirit. The son does not share his sonship with the spirit of the father. Uh, so the spirit does not share his spiritness uh, with the son and the father. So these things cannot be shared, which means they are in communicable. So it's not that the father could randomly make the son another father. Uh, that, that by definition is not uh, what, what a person is. Okay, so it's not communicable, but it subsists only and completely in itself. So it's that element that is subsists or exists in and of itself without being shared or derived. So it's not like the son derives a sonship that belongs to the father. The son does derive... The us his usia from the father as son, and that that constitutes in some way his sonship, but the sonship itself is not a property of the father that is shared with the son. Uh, Thomas Aquinas speaks about the persons as subsistent relations, which basically means that we understand the distinction in persons by the way that those persons are related to one another. So we understand the Son as the one who's begotten of the Father, the Spirit as the one who proceeds from Father and the Son, and the Father as one who was underived, but from whom the spiration of the Spirit and the begetting of the Son comes. And then here's a, a definition from Widener here, where he's talking about, about these subsistent relations. He says, there's a peculiar mode of subsistence by reason of which each is distinguished from the other. So there is a uniqueness to the relations that define the persons as unique. In other words, there's, they're not just these kind of three persons that don't have any inherent connection to one another or that are identical in all senses. They relate, they're identical in essence, but they relate to one another in different ways. So we don't speak of the Father as begotten. We don't speak of the Spirit as begotten. We don't speak of the Son as proceeding. We don't speak of the Father as proceeding. Uh, we speak of the Father as ungenerate, but we would not use that kind of terminology to refer to the Son and the Spirit. So there is something distinct about the, how the persons relate to one another that constitutes their personhood in distinction from one another. All right, so then we have to keep in mind that the persons are distinct from human persons. We are not, we're using the term person as a, a human analogy, it's kind of the closest, best term that we've come up with to describe to describe what they are, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we're not using this term in, in a univocal sense, univocal meaning in an exact sense that relates to how it is true in the created world. So when I say personhood, in terms of what I mean by God and what I mean by a human person is not identical. They are not univocal. 
So um, they are they are distinct. So here are some ways that they are distinct from individual human persons. Well, in an individual human person, you have individual wills, and those wills can you know come into conflict with one another. You can have different ideas about what we should do or doing different things. You don't have that within God. You have a singular will. Uh, consciousness. There are three consciousnesses. Now, sometimes people do speak about the Trinity as three at the persons of the, the Triune Godhead as three distinct centers of consciousness. And that terminology, just to be clear, is not classical Trinitarian terminology. Some have used that terminology today, but there are uh, dangers with that kind of terminology. So this is something that you can see in our programs on social Trinitarianism, where we discuss some of that. Uh, they don't have, you know, kind of distinct experiences, right? A human can have a, an experience that is totally separate from the experience of the other humans. Uh, that is not true of the trained Godhead. There is a sharedness of the experiences. And so when we're talking about these hypotheses, they are three, just to be clear, that our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is no possibility of some other hypothesis kind of popping into existence at, at some time. And, and so that triunity of God is of the essence. It's a necessity that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh, God cannot just create however many hypostases. Uh, that is part of the, the very nature of God. All right, so then we're going to move from there to talk about uh, a, a, another important distinction that theologians use when they're talking about the Trinity and how God works, how the Trinity functions, how we understand the Trinity. And that is a distinction between uh, the opera ad intra and the opera ad extra. And these are, those are the Latin phrases here. And as you can see, I have the title of this slide here as internal works. So the opera ad intra are the works that are internal to the triune Godhead. And the opera ad extra are the works that are external to the triune Godhead. And so this distinction helps us to understand what the difference is between God as he is in himself and God as he works in the economy of, of redemption, and, and not just redemption, but also judgment and all of the other things that, that God does. Okay, so uh, the internal work, so the opera ad intra, refers to that which is between the triune persons only. The opera ad intra has nothing to do with anything outside of God, or such as God's relationship to creation. So when we're talking about this opera ad intro, we're speaking about those Trinitarian or triune relations. Now, we have these three distinct personal propositions. These terms that we use to differentiate the Father, Son, and Spirit from one another. And as we're going to start to, to see as we look at the text of Scripture, this does come from Scripture. There are reasons we use the terms that we do. So the first is paternity or this is being the one who begets, the one who is the father. And that is, of course, the quality of the father. So if we speak about paternity, paternity only belongs to the father. Never are we told that, you know, the son is the father of the spirit or the spirit is the father of the son or, or anything else. Well, clearly, the father is called father in distinction from to make his role, his, his personhood, distinct from the other two triune persons. So paternity is that eternal act of begetting, of, of eternally being the father of the son. Then we have the act of filiation, or we can say of being begotten, and that is the son. He is eternally being begotten. He is the eternally begotten son of of the father. So the son is always son. So when we're saying that father-son relationship uh, is, when we're identifying that as something that's true of God in himself, ad intra, what we mean is that that father-son relation is not just something that is true of the incarnation. So it's not that you have these three persons that have no inherent relation to one another as father and son or anything else, you know, this kind of maybe total egalitarian, and, and it is egalitarian in some way, I guess, so that categories, those categories probably don't fit very well, but I mean that there's no distinction between the uh, father, son, and spirit, say, that any could have become incarnate, right? Or that, uh, so that 
you know, if the father chose, he could be the son and be incarnate. And, you know, we're saying that, no, this is not, the father-son relationship is not just something that is true in human history, in the divine economy, by divine decree. This is something that is actually true of God's eternal being, who he always is and always will be. And then we have the third of these personal propositions, which is spiration. This is the being breathed out or proceeding from. And we're talking here about the spirit. Now we'll discuss there are some differences between the Eastern Church and the Western Church over the nature of procession, whereas the Eastern Church says the spirit proceeds um, only from the Father. The Western Church would say from the Father and the Son. There's a whole talk on that on the filioque. Um, so these, when we're talking about opera, opera ad intra, we're talking really about relations of origin or source. Who is the source of who? So in a sense, we could say the Father is the source of the Godhead. He's the source eternally of the Son, and the Father and the Son eternally are the source of the Holy Spirit. Um, Widener also mentions here, he says, well, technically, you know, we could divide these, these three propositions into five properties. Uh, and some theologians have used that distinction as well. So, and there's an image of Widener here on our slide, but let's go through all five of these. The first is, again, esia, and inbilitas, um, or not having been begotten. So this is the, this is the property of the father, that the father is not begotten. The father is not originate. And when I say begotten, we don't use the language of begottenness by the Spirit, but we're saying that he has no origin from another. So even though we're saying not having been begotten, we're also saying not proceeding, not, not being of anyone else. Okay, so we look at Scripture, the Spirit is of God. The Son is Son of the Father. The Father is never described as being of anything. He is simply the Father. He is not generate. Uh, he is, is eternal. Is not derived from any other. So that's the first property. The second is paternity, which is the father being the source of the son. So the first is, again, esia, uh, or inescabilitas, is the father's not having been begotten, but paternity is his act of, of active begetting, that he is the source eternally of the son. Then we have uh, spiration. Uh, this is in the Father and the Son, and we, we can call this an active spiration or an active procession where the Father and the Son together are active in breathing out the Holy Spirit. Uh, the fourth property that we have here is affiliation in the Son. So that is the being begotten of, of the Son. So that's what distinguishes 2.2 2 and, and 4. 2 is the Father being the source of the Son. Uh, of, of generation, and the fourth point is affiliation of the Son or the Son's being begotten. So sometimes there's a distinction here that's made between active generation, which is that of the Father, and passive generation, which is that of the Son. But to be clear, when we're saying active and passive generation, we are not distinguishing between two different generations. We're, these are just different ways to describe that eternal relation, the, the active on behalf of the Father and the passive on behalf of the Son. So it's just the same exact relation, just viewed at, at different angles from each person. And then we have the uh, procession, which is passive in the Holy Ghost himself. So we have that active spiration for that breathing out to the Father and Son of the Spirit. And then we have the passive procession in the Holy Ghost himself, who is the one who is breathed out or proceeds or is spirated. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little more specifically then about the the relationship between the Son and the Father, what is referred to as the eternal generation of Christ. Now, the image that you see on this slide, if you're watching the video, is of Origen of Alexandria. Now, Origen of Alexandria is, is a bit of a controversial figure in many ways. <laughs> I have a video on some of the controversy surrounding Origen, uh, but Whatever you think about origin, I think there's a lot of good, great, uh, there's there's a lot of great theology in origin. There's also some weird stuff in origin. He's kind of a mixed bag in many ways, but uh, I think we should be kind to origin, especially because he was, a, in many ways, the first systematic theologian. So we shouldn't expect him to get everything right. So he's got some weird ideas. But, uh, but nonetheless, uh, origin is here because he's really the first theologian who deals extensively with this question of the eternal 
generation of Christ. He speaks a lot about Christ as being eternally generate, eternally begotten of the Father. Um, so, where does this idea come from? There, there are some controversies today. There are some people who deny eternal generation and say this is a, just a philosophical speculation. It's, it's not a biblical doctrine. It doesn't come from the text of Scripture at all. So, we're going to ask the question, well, does this idea of the Son being eternally generate of the Father, eternally begotten of the Father, does this have biblical backing? And so I have a couple, you know, I have some texts here and some, some reasons for believing that in the text. So the first set of texts are those that speak about the Son as really being of the Father. So there is something distinct about the Son-Father relationship in that the Father is never said to be of the Son, but repeatedly he is the Son of the Father. So there's something distinct about the of the fatherness of the Son that is not true of the Father you know, vice versa in the other sense of the relationship. Uh, so this is this text here that I have first is one that's that's very often cited. It's very significant to these discussions, and that is John 5, 26, where Jesus says, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And so this is a really interesting text because we have here Jesus saying that the Father is is God in himself, right? He, he has the property of self-existence, but he says that, that though he has life in himself, and that's a property of God, right? That self-existence is, is the property of God. Nothing else is self-existent other than God. But he's saying that though the father has this life in himself, this self-existence, he has also granted that same thing to the son. So the son also has self-existence, but that self-existence is a granted self-existence from the father. So the father has life in himself. All life comes from God. Uh, and the son also has life in himself, but it's a derived having life in himself. So what we're saying here is there is this relationship between father and son where the father has these divinity in himself, but that is then shared, it's granted to, to the Son. So we have this sharing of this, these divine attributes between Father and Son that only goes one direction, which is Father to Son, not Son up to Father. Okay, then we have the second text here, which is Colossians 1.15, where it says of, of the Son, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Now, to some extent here, we are speaking about the... Uh, the resurrection of Jesus. So there is an element of the divine economy in this particular text. Uh, in other words, the, how God is working at redemption in history. But this does go beyond that to look at eternal relations. Now, I think if you look at the context of Colossians 1, I would just ask you to just read the text. Uh, it, because I, uh, this is a by nature an overview. I'm not doing an in-depth exegesis of each of these texts, and I'm very limited in the text I'm using. There are many more. So this is an overview. Um, but we're seeing that the Son is, he is the image of God. He is something of the Father. Again, he is of the Father, right? He is the image of the Father. Uh, then he is referred to as the only begotten. You know, we've got John 3, 16 is the most famous text, the only begotten Son. Now, uh, John uses that phrase multiple times as well, and not just in John 3, 16. But the term that is used there is the Greek term monogenes. Now, there is, uh, there is a debate uh, about the meaning of this particular term, uh, particularly the genes aspect of the term, <laughs> uh, as to whether this, is, this means one and only or only begotten. So only unique is one way of, of looking at this text. Now, I will say that it, perhaps I'll do something separate on this, this debate where I get into some of the details here, but I'm compelled by the monogamous is only, is only begotten. That's how older translations have it. It does seem like that's how the fathers who spoke Greek natively read this text, but there has been a shift away from that toward this understanding of it as, as one and only so that the phrase begotten is not really used of, of the son. Uh, no, I disagree with that interpretation, but I will say, the eternal generation of Christ is not solely dependent upon the validity of the phrase only begotten son. So sometimes I've seen this argument thrown out that, well, the eternal generation of Christ is really just based on one particular 
idea in the Bible that's, you know, there just kind of briefly that Jesus is, you know, the only begotten of God. And okay, so if that translation is wrong, then the doctrine of eternal generation doesn't really have scriptural warrant. And I just say that that's not true because we have, we have all of these other texts. And what we're really speaking about is the fact that the son is eternally of the father. And that's really what we mean when we're saying eternal generation. Okay, so then we have uh, Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in his last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of, of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. So here we have that he is of the Father, and this is going beyond the just economy of redemption. We're speaking here pre-incarnation because he's talking about, you know, he has this imagery related to creation itself here. So Jesus is the brightness of the Father's glory. He is the image of his person. So his person is the image of the Father. So there is an ofness of the Son that is eternal. Another place we see this is in the wisdom Christology text that we find throughout the New Testament. I have one citation there, which is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. And Paul, 1 Corinthians especially, uses this wisdom Christology extensively, but it's not only there in 1 Corinthians. Uh, what I mean by wisdom Christology is, there's a lot of scholarship on this. You can find all sorts of books and articles written on wisdom Christology if you do a quick search. But wisdom Christology is this idea that Paul speaks about Jesus largely as divine wisdom, as the wisdom that is of God. And there's imagery taken from the book of Proverbs in the way that Paul deals with this. Uh, but it's recognized that this is one of the most common images or ways of understanding the relationship between father and son, and especially the writings of Paul, is this notion of wisdom, so that he is the wisdom of God. Okay, so it's not that the Father is the wisdom of the Son. It's, even the Spirit's not said to be the wisdom of the Father. There's something distinctive about the Son, that he is the wisdom of God. And that is something that is eternally true. He is eternally of the Father. Now, when, maybe I should clarify this when I say of God. In, in Paul, it tends to be the case that the term theos for God refers to the Father. The term kurios for Lord tends to refer to the Son. So when we are using the theological terminology in, in a creedal sense to say that the three persons are one God, that doesn't mean that the term God or theos in Scripture always refers to the three persons at once. Very often, God refers to the Father. This isn't always the case. So we certainly have places in the New Testament where where the Son is called God and the Spirit as well. But you think of you know Thomas crying out to Jesus, my Lord and my God. So we do have instances of the Son being called God. But oftentimes that God and Lord, those two terms, which are both common Old Testament terms to refer to, uh, to God, the God of Israel, but they are distinguished so that God often has a particular referent to the Father and Lord has a particular referent to the Son. Uh, again, not always the case, but it's often the case. So it's, it's important to recognize as you're looking at some of these texts. All right. Uh, then we have the fact in Scripture that it is the Father who sends the Son. So we have Matthew 10, 40. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. So there's this relationship of sending. The Father is the one who sends the Son. And we're going to talk about relationship between economy and ontology, where, which means that the, the relations eternally between the persons show themselves in the history of how God relates to the world. So there is a, in that, that ad intra, that internal Trinitarian relationship between Father and Son, is that the Father is begetting the son, the son is of the father. So that's going to show itself at extra in the world, in the elements of creation and redemption, 
that the son is going to be the one that is sent by the father rather than the other way around. So Luke 10, 16, here's another one. He who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me. And he who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. So that's just another text that speaks about the son as the one that is being sent by the father. Now, those kinds of texts are all over the place. We're just looking at a small selection of texts. There are plenty more of all of these that we could look at. Okay, then we have uh, more proofs of the eternal generation of Christ here on this side. We, we have two things that are mentioned here. Uh, and the first of those is that the father, when the father acts, he does, he acts through the son. Again, it's not that the son acts through the father, but the father acts through the son. You see this eternal ordering. So John 1, 3, all things were made through him, through the Logos, through the Son. And without him, nothing was made that was made. So God is the, the Father is the instrument of creation, but the Father creates through the Son. So the Son has a has a mediating role in that relationship because that's, that's how God works. God works as Father through Son and through Spirit. And that's why we speak about there being one power, right? One working, because it is that Father's working that is through the Son and the Spirit as well. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, uh, Paul says, yet for us, there is one God, the Father. Okay, so here is where, uh, to, I'm taking a step back for a second here to, to give some clarity. The Here is where we see that fa that uh, theos kurios distinction, theos being God, kurios being Lord, between Father and Son in Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. So the, the Jews, the Jewish people, would have known very well the statement known as the Shema. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And if you have any Jewish friends today, they probably know it in Hebrew and say it often. You know, it's a very it's a very well known basic Jewish creed. So we they use in, in if you're translating that into Greek, you have the terms theos and, and kurios. So the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So you have this back and forth between phrases Lord and God. So what Paul is doing here in 1 Corinthians 8 is he's kind of taking that apart and saying we have Lord Jesus and God Father. So he's saying within that identity of the one God that the Jews confess in their monotheistic confession of faith, they are including the identity not only of the Father but also of the Son. Okay, now we can read the text. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. So there's a distinction between Father as, as of, we come, we are of him, and then he does things through the Lord Jesus, so through the Son. So the works are of the Father through the Son. So we see that distinction in language in the works of God. Ephesians 1.3, uh, Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And so this is just a reference to the Son as being of the Father, right? The Father is identified as the Father of the Lord Jesus. So we have this Father-Son relation. Now, I, I want to just point out, and there are other texts we can look at as well, that the Father-Son relationship is not just something that is true in the life of Jesus. You have these early groups, the heretical groups, the Ebionites, others that show up and start to say that the son was adopted as son at some point in time. So there is not this triune eternal relationship as father of father and son. Instead, they would say that, you know, that relationship is created in time, whether it's because of Jesus's you know, obedience or that is that father son relationship is created at the baptism of Jesus, or the resurrection or the virgin birth or whatever. Um, but here's a text from Paul in Galatians 4, 4 to just make it clear. He says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. So in other words, we see the ordering that this is the son of God who is now sent to be born of a woman under the law to make us sons. So the it, it's important also here that there's a connecting point between the eternal relationship between the son and the father and our redemption. So the reason why Jesus can bring us into the family of God is because he is the eternal true son of the father. So that through him, if we are united to him, that's how we become adopted as God's children. That's how we come into the family of God. 
Okay, so let's then define eternal generation. So we've seen this in a variety of biblical texts. We have uh, ample biblical evidence of the fact that the Son is eternally of the Father, is eternally Son uh, of the Father. So what do we mean exactly by the term generation? So we have a quote here from Johannes Quenstedt, who was another 17th century Lutheran theologian, and he says this, it is an unceasing emanation like which there is nothing to be found in nature. For God from eternity begat and always begets and never will cease to beget his son. And so what we're saying here, he's saying a number of things here. One is he's trying to, to make it clear that when we're speaking about father-son relationship or using the language of begetting, we are using that as a human analogy of a divine reality that is far greater. So he's saying there's nothing like this father-son relationship in nature because in a human relationship between father and son, you know, the son is born in time. There, first of all, there was a time when the son was not yet born and then your son was born, right? I have two sons. So there, I could point to a time before they were born. I could point to the moment that they were born. Uh, they are not continually being born. They do continually have the relationship with me as my sons, but that is in light of where they came from. <laughs> so it's not a continual, continual act. Now, what we have to understand is that God himself is outside of time. So there is no before and after when we're speaking about the eternal relations of the triune persons. There's a before and after when we're talking about the world and how God relates to the world and the, the world's view. But when we're speaking about those ad intra operations, there is only an eternal now in God. So there's not even a possibility of a before and after in God. Those categories don't don't make sense with God. So we can't speak about the Son being begotten at some point in time, uh, and and you know his relationship to the Father somehow somehow changing. And so instead, it's that that begetting or that Son being of the Father, the emanation of the Son from the Father, is something that is eternal. It's always true. So when we say that the Father always begets, we're not saying that the Father is continually begetting the son as a number of distinct moments, but God is exists in eternity. And so he has, he is always in that eternal moment begetting the son. And so that, that never ceases. So, you know, think about this. It, it's like when, when I'm speaking about my sons, both of my sons and their dependency upon me and my existence for their existence, in one sense, I can say, yes, in terms of their existence, they always, they only exist because I exist, right? If I didn't exist, the power to be would not be there with, with my kids. Um, so I have to be the cause of their existence in some way. However, the, the necessity of me being the cause of their existence is only for their birth. Now, if I die before they do, uh, and hopefully they live uh, you know, to be old and maybe I'll live to be old too and I'll die before them. Well, if that happens, do they cease to exist? No, because their continued existence is reliant upon a past event that I was involved in, not not a continued reliance. But that is the, the distance that we have in human persons, even a close familiar relationship that is distinguished from God. So for God, instead, it's that that father-son relationship is one that is uh, of, there's an eternal necessity of the father's sustenance of the essence of the son. Okay, so that's, that's an important distinction to make. So what is eternal generation not? And sometimes when we're speaking about theology, specifically when we're talking about God and the nature of God, a lot of times we can speak more about what's not true than what is. So sometimes we, we can clarify, especially unhelpful understandings or unhelpful ways of speaking about things. So eternal generation is not, so the first point is it's not an optional or free act of will, which means that it's not that the father chose to have a son and that the father could have made a very different choice. So the father could have chosen that he had 12 sons eternally and eternally begot 12 sons. Uh, th there is a kind of freedom in God's creation when we're speaking about created things, whereas he is doing things of will. So he wills to make the world. He wills to make the world in the way that it is. 
Did he have to make the world the way it was? Well, there's a freedom in God that he didn't, wasn't, it wasn't necessitated that he created the world um, in the exact way that he did choose to create it. There's no necessity, there's no absolute kind of ontological necessity in my existence. I mean, a necessity of being by ontological. Uh, but there is in God, right? There, there is no possible world in which God does not exist. He exists in all possible worlds because he is a, the only necessary being. And as necessary being, that includes the three persons. So the, the eternal generation of Christ is, it's both a natural it's both natural, as in it is, it is part of the nature of God that he that the, the Father begets the Son, and it is also a necessary act. So it's not an optional act of begetting that the Father someday could choose not to, you know, beget the Son anymore or something. It's a necessary act. Uh, eternal generation is not improper and metaphorical, so it's not purely metaphor, and you can, it, it's analogy, but it's not pure metaphor. What we mean by that is that, um, that the, the metaphor, you, you could say that, uh, well, the eternal, Jesus is not actually begotten of the father. It is just a metaphorical statement to say that he eternally exists and the father eternally exists. Um, this is something like what you find in John Calvin. So there are some and I know there are different readings of Calvin on this, but there are some critiques of that you'll find from Lutherans of the, the Calvinist position, at least in John Calvin. I don't think this shows up in later Reformed scholastics, but uh, in John Calvin, he seems to take a largely metaphorical reading of that notion of eternal generation, so that it really is it, that there is no sense in which the Son is actually derived from the Father. That it's just kind of a metaphor to describe the fact that he always is Son and he is autotheos or God in himself. Um, you could look at someone today like Scott Oliphant, who holds to to that view that would be rejected by uh, the Lutheran Orthodox. And certainly, I would uh, I would reject. Okay, then uh, we have okay. It's also it's not physical, but it's hyperphysical. So it's not a physical begetting. God is not a physical being. He is physical in the incarnation, uh, but he is not by nature a physical being. So it's not a physical begetting like we have with human persons when they procreate. It is hyperphysical. It means it's beyond the physical. It's not less real than the physical. So I use the term hyperphysical. So we're, we're not saying that it's somehow less than the physical, but it's more than that. It's far beyond the realm of God is far beyond the realm of the physical. Um, it is not external, but internal. What we mean is the when we're speaking about God creating things in the world, it is an external act. It is an ad extra act. It's an act that is outside of himself. He creates things that are not him, that are other things outside of him. When something is internal to God, we're saying that it's internal to his being. So it's an ad intra work. So begetting is something that is inherent to who God is in his own nature, in his own eternal life, not outside of himself. Uh, it is also not accidental, but essential. These being philosophical terms uh, taken from, from Aristotle, that for something to be accidental means that it's not necessary to the thing to be what it is. So, for example, the you know, if I have this desk, uh, uh, this is sitting on a desk right now, and it's this kind of like cherry wood. If I felt like it, I could uh, sand down this desk and paint it blue. I wouldn't do that. But if I did, uh, it would still be the same desk. But the color would be an accidental property because it would still remain the same, even though some external thing about it happened to change. So we're saying that it is not just an accidental thing to God that the Son is begotten. It is not just... Uh, you know, something that's not essential to the divine being, but instead it is essential. So it is essential to the divine being, right? So we understand that, that some things are essential versus accidental. Uh, there are some things that are needed for a desk to be a desk. You know, I think like my desk has, you know, four legs and at least has to have some of those legs in order to be a desk, because if it didn't have them, it would just be sitting on the floor and it would be I don't know, it could be a lap desk, but it wouldn't be a desk in the same sense, right? Uh, so it's essential to God that the Son is, is begotten. It's one of those things that is necessary uh, for the divine being. So, so that's the father-son relation. Now we have the question of the eternal procession of the Spirit. So how is it that now the Spirit relates to the Father, and how does the Spirit relate to the Son? All right, so uh, this also is something that is taken from Scripture. 
And there aren't as many texts here that I have. There are a lot of them, though. And the reason I didn't include as many texts is largely because the fact that the Spirit is of God is just so obvious. <laughs> so, like, almost every time he's mentioned, he's called the Spirit of God. Uh, so, it, it, it's very obvious. Okay, but um, we, there's certainly more text than the ones that I have here. But first we have John 15, 26. This really becomes the most essential text for at least the terminology that we use, uh, where Jesus says, when the Helper, he's talking about the Spirit, comes, whom I will send to you from the Father the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. So the term procession, when we say the spirit proceeds, it just comes from this text. So the spirit proceeds from the Father. Now, th that doesn't mean that that's the only text that speaks about the procession of the spirit. That just gives us the particular term that we are using. Every text that says that the spirit is of God is a text that testifies to procession to the fact that just as the Son is of the Father, the Spirit also is of the Father. Again, we don't have the opposite being the case. We're never told that the Father is of the Spirit or that the Son is of the Spirit, but we are told that the Spirit is of the Father and that the Spirit is of Christ as well. So uh, we have some text where the Spirit is of God, Genesis 1-2. I mean, we could go back to the very beginning. The Spirit hovers above the waters. It's called the Spirit of God. Uh, Ezekiel 36-27, talking about the, the New Covenant. Matthew 3.16, uh, but the Spirit is not only of God, meaning of the Father, but he is also said to be of Christ as well in a variety of texts. And the Filioque podcast gets more into more of those texts, but we have two of these here, which is Romans 8.9, 1 Peter 1.11. These speak about the Spirit as being of Christ. So for recognizing that these, the, the language of of, one person being of another, is this language of relation and origin, then when we see that the Spirit is said to be of Christ, just as of the Father, that we would say this also is a phrase referencing that eternal relations and, and origin. Now, there are three approaches that we have here to the procession of the Spirit uh, and, and the Spirit's relationship to the Father and the Son. So the Eastern view is that the Spirit proceeds from the Father. So this disagreement is seen in the Nicene Creed, in the way that the Nicene Creed is recited, uh, the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father. Then you have this phrase in the Creed that says, and the Son. This is filioque. So this phrase is not used in Eastern churches, but it is used in most Western churches when they recite the Nicene Creed. You can watch the filioque video to get in, in detail treatment of the history and theology there. Um, so the Eastern view is that the Spirit just proceeds from the Father, and they would point to the text like John 15, 26, which only mentions procession from the Father. Uh, but the West would say, no, the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, and that's where they would point to, we would point to texts like that the Spirit is, or is of Christ, the Spirit of Jesus. And then you have a kind of mediating view that shows up, <clears throat> that's sometimes been proposed as a way to kind of unify East and West, and that is the idea that the Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son, which I don't personally have an issue with that because that seems to be the way that the language of the Father working works, certainly at extra, so at intro it would kind of make sense as well. But uh, this is the idea that, that they are both involved in procession, but there's a distinction between Father and Son. So that proceeds from the Father, but through the Son. And that way you could still affirm that the Spirit is genuinely of the Son as well as of the Father. Okay. Uh, details of spiration now. Some things to say about spiration, um, similar to what we talked about with, with generation. Um, we have active versus passive spiration. Uh, so the active spiration is the act of the Father and the Son breathing forth the Spirit. Uh, and so that's of the Father and the Son. I am a Western Christian here, so I'm saying that's the case. Um, and then there is the passive spiration, which is the fact that the spirit is the one being spirated, or the spirit is the one being breathed out, or the spirit is the one proceeding. So all three of those terms are okay to use to describe this act. Um, now we have, this is David Hallatz here uh, in our image, another 17th century Lutheran theologian. He's the one, uh, the kind of last great theologian of this era, writing at the very end of the century and beginning of the next. Um, he has a list of three things that he says the spirit is, that, that spiration is not. So just as we looked at a generation to say it's not this, it's not that, um, we have a, the same kinds of things used here. Um, 
it, it, we don't have also this, this vibration of the spirit because this isn't mentioned here in this this little list that Hall Ads gives us. But this the breathing out of the spirit, vibration of the spirit, is also necessary. So when we're saying something like the sun, it's it's also not a, an optional thing that God chooses to breathe out the spirit. It's it's of God's essence and it's necessary that it happens. Um, so spiration is not external like human breathing, but internal. So why we have that language of breathing is that to to be spirated, we have that language of, of breathing that's biblical imagery that's used to refer to, and we even have that literally happening when Jesus breathes on the disciples and the Holy Spirit uh, is breathed onto them, uh, where we would say that that breathing in history is, is really an outworking of what is that eternal breathing out of the Holy Spirit. So if we use that human language of breathing, we're saying it's not external like human breathing, right? If I breathe, my breath is going out into the world outside of myself. This breathing of the Spirit is internal to the Godhead. So it's an internal breathing to himself, not something external in the world outside of himself. Uh, it is not transitory and evanescent. So it's not... Um, you know, it's not something that is just this happens for for a time, but instead it is eternal and permanent. And remember, when we say eternal, God is exists in the eternal now. God is atemporal. God exists outside of the bounds of time. That is part of God's eternality, uh, God's immensity. That He exists outside of the con any human confines. He exists outside of the confines of space, time, and everything else. Uh, so that means that. If there is an act of breathing out of the spirit, that is an eternal act, not a temporary act. Uh, like the beginning of the sun, it is not accidental. Um, so it's not just a kind of quality of who God is that kind of could, could go <laughs> and God would still be essentially God. No, it's essential to God. So it's essential to the divine nature that the spirit uh, proceeds. All right. So then we have, and uh, this is Johannes Schwenstedt again here. Um, we're asking the question, how is it that the persons are distinguished from one another? So this is kind of a summary of what, of what we've talked about at this point, um, but we're gonna have a number of negations. So what it is not, again. So there are false ways to describe the distinction of the persons, and then there are right and orthodox ways to describe distinctions of, of person. Um, so, they are not distinguished in the order of nature. What we mean by it's not like one nature is different from another. So that one has a divine nature, one has something of a different nature. And this was the primary debate that led to the Council of Nicaea. The question of, is the son of the same essence or substance as the father or a different essence? So homo usioi is that they are of the same nature. Um, the homo usios, so that the son is of the same nature as the father. Uh, so they're not to be distinguished in in nature. So we're not saying one is divine and one is like divine. They they are they share the same uh, divine essence. They are not distinguished by an order of time. Just as I said, you know, human persons are distinguished by order of time to some degree, right? Something that distinguishes me from my kids is that I was born at a different time than they were. Um, instead, the divine persons are all atemporal. They're outside of the bounds of, of time. They're not to be distinguished in order of dignity. It's not that the because the Father is the source of the Son and Spirit, that doesn't mean that the Father now is more dignified than the Son or Spirit. It doesn't mean that the Father is more worthy of worship. They're more glorious than the Son and the Spirit. Instead, they are all equally worthy of worship and praise. They are equally glorious, equally glorified, equally beautiful, equally good. So we're not we're not speaking about a dignity that is greater in one person uh, than the others. Instead, we are saying that the way to distinguish them is by the order of origin. So we're recapping this again, that the way that the persons are distinguished from one another is the origin of the persons from one another. So the distinction between the Son and the Father is that the Son is of the Father. The distinction between the Spirit and the Father is that the Spirit is of the Father. The distinction between Spirit and Son is that the Spirit is of the Son and Father, and the Son in no way is, is of the Spirit. So these eternal relations of, of both origin, and then we have an order of, of relation as well, um, that 
that Quenstedt mentions here. But we're talking about order of relation and order of origin. We're really speaking about, about the same thing here. Well, I think that brings us just about, it looks like, to close to an hour. So I think that's probably a good place to stop here. So we'll uh, continue this in another program as we go through some of the other basics of Trinitarian uh, theology. So uh, let me know if you like this PowerPoint format. I've been using this more to prep some programs recently. I know some people have said that they have a hard time following the points that I have, and it would be more helpful to have something like an outline. Uh, so here it is. I've got these PowerPoints. Let me know if you do want me to keep doing this, because it obviously takes time to put together PowerPoints. Uh, but uh, if it is that much easier to follow along, it's probably worthwhile. Um, some people have asked if the PowerPoints could be made available. I have to think about how I want to do that. I do want to make them available. It may be that, that it becomes a benefit for patrons or other donors, but I'm not totally sure about that. Uh, so anyway, thank you so much for watching and or listening. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube and in your podcast app, and we'll see you in the next one. God bless.